Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Wally Overman, Vice Chairman of the Dare County Board of Commissioners and Co-Chair, along with Ms. Roxanna Ballinger of the Saving Lives Task Force, which is responsible for this town hall event here tonight. Roxanna, please stand and be recognized. Uh, I'm nominating Roxanna for the Best Co-Chair in the Universe Award, <laughs> just as... I'd also like to thank Town Bank and Mr. Taylor Sugg for sponsorship and providing our food and refreshments uh, tonight. Taylor, thank you. I'd like to thank you all for being here this evening for our first Town Hall of 2018. We have a number of presentations here tonight that I think you will find educational and helpful with regard to substance use disorder. These will come from this distinguished panel of speakers, including Dr. Zach Moore of the North Carolina Division of Public Health, Donnie Varnell, Special Investigator of the Dare County Sheriff's Department, Debbie Dutton, Director of Clinical Services for the Health Department, Wendy Hall, Communicable Disease and Nursing Supervisor from our Health Department, Pastor Frank Lassen of the Source Church, and Rebecca Paulson of the Source Church, who is coordinator of the Needle Exchange Program there. Roxanna will be introducing them to you in greater detail this evening prior to their presentations. We have several county leaders in attendance here tonight that I would like to recognize, including Mr. Bob Woodard, Chairman of the Dare County Board of Commissioners, Sheriff Doug Dowdy, Mayor Sheila Davies of Kill Devil Hills, KDH Commissioner John Winley, and Mary Helen Goodlow Murphy of the Coastland Times. I'd also like to thank everyone who provided resource tables in the rotunda with information on prevention and treatment here tonight. If I've overlooked anyone, please forgive me. It will invariably happen when you start calling names. Um, thank you all for being here and for your service. Uh, and thank you for your support of the Saving Lives Task Force and its mission to fight substance use in Dare County. Please be sure to pick up a copy of the initiative that we should have in the lobby if you haven't already. In it, you will find several articles regarding substance, abuse dis substance use disorder and treatment with a spotlight in this particular issue on needle exchange programs. The initiative is a quarterly publication created by the Saving Lives Task Force to educate, inform, and engage the citizens of Dare County on the recognition, prevention, treatment, and recovery of substance use disorders. After all the presentations are completed, you will have a chance to ask our panel any questions you may have, so please hold your questions until then. It is now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening who will address infectious diseases related to the opioid epidemic and the importance of syringe exchange programs. He is Dr. Zach Moore, and he serves as a state epidemiologist and the chief of the epidemiology section with the North Carolina Division of Public Health. He received a medical degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a master's degree in public health from Harvard University. Dr. Moore completed training in pediatrics at Stanford University and in pediatric infectious diseases at Emory University. In a word, wow. <laughs> Dr. Moore joined the North Carolina Division of Public Health in 2006 as an officer with the Center for Disease Control's Epidemic Intelligence Service. As chief of the epidemiology section, his areas of responsibility include communicable diseases, occupational and environmental epidemiology, and public health preparedness and response. I'm really glad he's on our side. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Zach Moore. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you, um, Roxanna, and to the rest of the task force for inviting me to be with you all here. Um, it's a really, really important topic, something that I feel very passionately about, and uh, so I'm really glad to have the opportunity to share with you some of the parts that 
I think maybe don't always get considered quite as much um, when we talk about the opioid epidemic, which is a lot of the infections that can go along with injecting drug use. Um, but I'm kind of wearing two hats here tonight because I'm also representing um, our syringe service initiative. So I'm going to be starting out a little broader um, and uh, not just, and then I'll, I'll sort of focus on, in on the uh, infectious disease as I go along. Um, and because I'm wearing two hats, that means I've stolen a lot of slides from other people, but hopefully I will be able to answer any questions you might have on the non-infectious parts um, that, that are borrowed from some of our other colleagues who do a lot of great work within the Division of Public Health on this topic. So just to um, start off with a little dose of reality, you know, why we, why we are, are here, why we are worrying about this is this, this uh, opioid crisis, which is really more than an opioid crisis, but this, this um, epidemic of, uh, of substance use and misuse is taking a huge toll. It's killing, it's actually, I think, probably closer to five people per, per day in North Carolina as of our, our most recent number. So this is, a, this is a, a big problem and unfortunately going in the wrong direction. And that's brings me to this. I'm not sure how well you guys can see these, but uh, uh, this is just a little preview of things to come. You're going to see a lot of, uh, you invite an epidemiologist, you're going to see a lot of graphs. Sorry, people don't like graphs, but you know, that's what we do. Um, that's one caveat. And then you're going to see a lot of things going in the wrong direction. You're going to see a lot of things going up because unfortunately, um, we have not yet really wrapped our, our hands around how to how to address the many, many problems that are part of this opioid epidemic. Um, so much work to be done. What you can see here, um, to the extent that you can see it, is the increase in unintentional opioid deaths that's happened in North Carolina recently. And the green part of this is the increase that's happened over time that's due to prescription, um, prescription medications. And then the blue, both the uh, light blue and the dark blue there, show the, the synthetic narcotics piece of the, which is the sort of the newer drugs that have come on the scene and have really taken off. Um, so you can see now more than 50% more than of unintentional overdose deaths are due to these synthetic narcotics in North Carolina. So um, again, numbers going in the wrong direction and just shows the, the need for us to be aggressive in our, in our actions. Um, this is just a little slide because some of the, I don't, I'm not going to show you a lot of Dare County specific numbers, but I will show you stuff from regions and the region that it, you'll see maybe in some of these slides, region nine, that's just where we are now, the northeastern corner of the state. Um, but just to start off with looking at the, uh, at the statewide, you know what, I'll just stand back here a little bit, I can do that. Um, looking at the statewide medication and drug overdose deaths by intent, the lines that you can see here Overdose deaths, all deaths are the black line. The purple line shows the unintentional overdose deaths. The ones on the bottom are the, are the suicides and the, the intentional deaths. So you can see this is really clearly um, unintentional overdoses that are driving this. This is the state data. If you look at the region we're in right now, same story. Um, big increases over the past few years and all of it's being driven by people who are unintentionally overdosing. Uh, and this just shows um, county by county, and you can see Dare County actually there on the top. The, the rate of overdose deaths by population is actually not as bad as some of our counties, which is a wonderful thing, but it is higher than the state rate. So this is not something that uh, Dare County is by any, by any means immune to, and I don't have to tell you all that. Uh, I alluded to this before, but when you talk about what substances are killing people now, it's these newer sort of uh, synthetic or designer drugs that are really causing a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of problems with, with, with overdose deaths. And this slide kind of shows why. It kind of sh shows the potency of these different drugs. So the tiny little pill on the right, that's morphine. Um, that's, you know, where all this stuff is starts from. Heroin is twice as potent, again, as morphine. Fentanyl, which is the, the, the um, form that's used often in, in healthcare settings, is 100 times 
more potent than morphine. And then you start to look at some of these synthetic analogs, they're called these, these kind of designer um, fentanyl analogs like carfentanyl, 10,000 times more potent than morphine. So you can see how, um, how this can get out of hand quickly. And this just shows that in a graph form. So the green line here is uh, overdoses, overdose deaths specifically that are due to prescription opioids. So you can see that's where this problem really got started, um, was with people getting hooked on prescription opioids. And that's still what's driving a lot of this. But if you look over to where all those purple, the blue line and the dark purple line start going up there at the end, the dark blue line is heroin. So that's really taken off lately, you can see that the, the prescription overdose deaths are still still at the top there, but those the rate of increase in the heroin deaths, the rate of increase in the synthetic um, narcotics, which is that purple line, have just been skyrocketing. And here's the same thing, just looking specifically here um, at this part of the state, and um, it's pretty much the same trend. These are kind of smaller numbers, so you got to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but you can see pretty clearly that purple line that's the synthetic narcotics. There's no mistaking what's going on with that trend. The deaths from the synthetic narcotics have, have really um, just been increasing pretty astronomically in recent years, which gets back to that slide I showed you about the potency, the relative potency. These things really um, are really deadly. Um, there's lots of other, you know, overdose deaths is, is a, a a huge problem, and that's a main thing we're keeping our eyes on. But there's other, other problems that we'll talk about infections in just a minute. There's tremendous costs, of course, associated with these. Uh, and then there's these other problems that go along. And I'm sorry, this got a little wonky on the slide. But this is showing hospitalizations for neonatal abstinence syndrome. That's babies who were born to, to um, mothers who are addicted to substances. And you can see um, the darker colors indicate higher rates of um, of babies born with the neonatal abstinence syndrome, particularly out in the far western part of the state, um, huge, huge problem. It's also uh, an issue here in uh, in the eastern part of the state, not not quite so much. But this is uh, this is one of the growing problems with the opioid epidemic. Okay, so that's just a little bit of the sort of big picture of some of the problems that we're seeing related to this. But there's there's sort of little all these little sub-epidemics within the opioid epidemic, and these infectious complications that go along with it are, are an important one to consider, especially when you're talking about syringe exchange programs. So there's lots of possible infections that can go along with injected drug use. I don't know if that's me or not. I'll try to hold it up here, maybe. Don't touch that thing at the bottom. Um, the top three ones here are the ones that we usually think about um, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and HIV. So those are the ones that we consider our blood-borne viruses. Um, I think everyone's probably aware that sharing not just needles, not just syringes, but sharing other injection supplies can lead to transmission of all three of those viruses. So I'll talk about those. Um, and then something I think isn't really in the, the public awareness quite as much is this huge problem of, of some of the more serious bacterial infections that can occur in people who are injecting drugs. So I'll talk about that because um, with, the, with the viruses, you know, they're a huge problem, but they're not going to kill you right away, whereas some of these bacterial infections like sepsis, which is a bloodstream infection, and endocarditis, which is your heart valves, and skin infections, those are the things that can kill you pretty quickly. So um, with hepatitis C, we sort of look at it as there's two different epidemics going on with hepatitis C. Uh, the first one is what we now call our, our chronic or historic epidemic. This is uh, people who are chronically infected with hepatitis C. And this is primarily an issue with the baby boomers, people born between 1945 and 1964, who tend to have a much higher rate of hepatitis C that they contracted a lot earlier in their lives. And now those infections are starting to lead to some of the serious long-term complications. Uh, it's estimated that there's about 150,000 people in our state with chronic hepatitis C infection. And a lot of those people are unaware. Hopefully, people are starting to hear the message that if you are in that baby boomer group, you need to get tested for hepatitis C at least once. 
And the reason we care about hepatitis C is that it does cause some, some serious long-term complications. I won't go through all this, but basically out of every 100 people who are diagnosed, who, who contract hepatitis C, the majority of them, 75, 85%, are going to end up with a chronic infection. And then for down at the bottom of the slide, you can see about 5 to 20% will develop cirrhosis and liver failure, and about 1 to 5% of those people will die. So, um, you know, it is, it's not, it, it's, I think people used to say hepatitis C was something that you would die with but not die from. That's not really the case. Hepatitis C is, is a major cause of death and a growing cause of death in our country. Um, here you can see just one example of that for our state, which is liver cancer. Uh, liver cancer rates in North Carolina have doubled over the past 10 years. We can't blame this on our opioid epidemic. This is our baby boomers. This is that historic epidemic I'm talking about. But it kind of shows you what might happen if we don't get a handle on our hepatitis C new epidemic that's going on right now. Um, the rates have increased. They basically doubled in both men and women. Men have higher rates in this baby boomer group, but uh, both of them have doubled over the past 10 years, which is uh, very concerning. But what we're really talking about more tonight is our emerging epidemic. This is the epidemic of new infections, acute hepatitis C. And this is rapidly increasing. I'll show you some of that. This is happening more in younger, rural, and poorer communities, and, and of course, associated with injecting drug use. But basically, this is acute hepatitis C rates. I told you you'd see a lot of lines going up. And if you look at the, if you can see the blue line, if you can't see it, just trust me, it's going up. Um, our rates of acute hepatitis C have increased about 500% uh, over the past 10 years or so. Um, and keep in mind, or something that probably wouldn't be aware of, for every one person who's reported with acute hepatitis C, it's estimated there's about 15 others out there who are not, who, who have acute hepatitis C and are not reported. So we know that the, these numbers represent really just the tip of the iceberg. But even with, with that limitation, it's a huge, huge growing problem. Uh, hepatitis B is, um, hasn't been as big of an issue so far, but we have started to see hepatitis B was a huge success story. It, there's a vaccine. Hopefully everybody's had their vaccine. Uh, it's now part of the childhood series, and we were seeing really, really nice decreases in hepatitis B until this um, increase in injection drug use started up. And what we've seen lately is our hepatitis B rates have started to increase too. And we've actually gone out and done some investigations around these acute, these clusters of acute hepatitis B, and lo and behold, it's the same thing. It's these networks of injection drug use, um, people sharing a lot of equipment, uh, very high frequency of injections, et cetera, that's leading to this infection as well. So we've um, taken a lot of steps to try to tackle this, but it is definitely headed the wrong way. And then the third one is, is HIV. You can't really see much here. I mean, the great news with HIV is that it's now, um, you know, people are, are surviving a lot longer. So that's, that's wonderful news. Um, the flip side of that is that there's a lot more people living with HIV out there than there used to be because the survival time is much better. What we've started to see now that's so concerning is that our rates of new HIV, which had been decreasing, have really started to level off or, or in some cases increase. And so, you know, what we're worried about is we, we know we have these, in, these networks of injection drug use where hepatitis C is being spread, hepatitis B is being spread. And if you introduce one person with HIV into one of those networks, things can take off fast. You know, it's kind of like dry kindling ready for that flame. Um, are people here familiar with what happened in Scott County, Indiana? Does that ring any bells? Um, Austin, Indiana, uh, they had a... Um, huge HIV outbreak. It was actually not just HIV. It was an outbreak of HIV, and almost everybody was co-infected with hepatitis C. Uh, but by the time they figured it out, there were already over 100 people involved in this outbreak. It took off super fast. So that picture up there on the right is Mike Pence standing behind uh, Pam Patronus, who's the state epidemiologist up there, as they were trying to wrap their, their heads around this. And, um, you know, I think North Carolina is ahead of the curve on this one because they, they did not have syringe exchange legalized there at that time. Um, and in fact, even after this epidemic, in response to this, they did pass laws that said that syringe exchange could occur, but only if 
you could prove that there was an outbreak occurring, which is kind of crazy because that's <laughs> the horses left the barn at that time. So uh, you know, I think we have a lot to be um, proud of here with our um, our approach making a little more sense than that. But it's it's always a concern if you can spread hepatitis C like we're seeing. There's no reason you can't spread HIV, and we're we're monitoring that really closely. Okay. I want to talk about the bacterial infections, and the first one that's that's really um, occupying a lot of our our time and concern right now is endocarditis. Um, I put this picture up because I didn't want to show like a gross picture of a heart cut open, and this is a little more artistic. But endocarditis is basically where bacteria get into your bloodstream, they land on your heart valve, and then you develop what are called vegetations, which is why I thought this was a good slide to illustrate it. Um, and those, those vegetations on your, on your heart valves can do two things. They can destroy your heart valve and kill you, or they can break off and shoot out through your body. If they're in one side of the heart, they'll shoot into your lungs, and they'll cause um, pulmonary embolisms, and they'll cause lung infections. Uh, if they're on the other side of the heart, they'll shoot up into your brain, cause strokes, cause brain abscesses. They can get into your liver. You know, they can spread bacteria all over your body. So it's a, it's a very, um, very deadly condition. And uh, we're coming to the end of the graphs here, but just one more scary one for you. Um, we have some data from North Carolina that show that the rates of endocarditis in North Carolina that are associated with drug use have actually increased about 12-fold. Um, it doesn't show the time frame on the bottom, but that's only 2010 to 2015. 2010 is not that long ago, a 12-fold increase, and we just, I just was talking to someone today, and we have data for 2016 and 2017 that show it's increasing even faster, and when we talk to our medical colleagues, they tell us about sort of wards full of people with endocarditis um, related to injection drug use who are sitting there waiting for a surgery, either to get a valve replaced or, um, or to complete their, their uh, IV antibiotic therapy. Um, some of them are getting reinfected, a lot of them are getting reinfected, and it's, you know, it's pre presenting some, some real serious quandaries for physicians about how many valve replacement surgeries can you do on somebody. Um, and there's, you know, there's just not enough cardiac surgeons to even do it all. So this is a, this is a huge problem. The little uh, other line there is the sepsis, which is bloodstream infections, and those have also increased about fourfold. So huge, not quite as dramatic as the endocarditis, but a huge increase in both, both of those types of bacterial infections. And, you know, the bloodstream infections, there's a lot of things contributing to that. With the endocarditis, it's really clearly being driven by injection drug use, and this is just a picture that kind of illustrates why, you know, the situations in which people are injecting drugs are, are pretty far from sterile. So um, when you inject a needle, you can either, there's bacteria that were in the equipment, in the needle, in the syringe, or just bacteria that were on your skin or the environment, and you're pushing them directly into your bloodstream. So it's it's pretty um, pretty clear what's driving that what's driving that increase. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the bad news. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are being done about it, and um, I'm going to start with a couple other specific things before talking about what what you all are here to talk about and most interested in, which is the um, syringe exchange or syringe services programs. So for hepatitis C, I have to kind of beat this drum because I'm pretty proud of us. Um, you know, in, in our state, we did not have a hepatitis C program. Um, and I know because I was responsible for hepatitis C surveillance from the time I got here in 2006. And there really wasn't anything going on in terms of um, trying to do prevention or treatment for hepatitis C at that time. And then the real game changer is we got these new antiviral medications for hepatitis C. So this is now a curable disease. You know, back up until a few years ago, we had treatments. They were very hard to take. They made people feel terrible. The success rate was not good. Um, not a lot of doctors wanted to do it at all. And now it's been just night and day. You know, this is like 95% cure rates, 95% plus. So things have really changed. So, so we, between that and the fact that we have this 
huge skyrocketing increase, we felt like we had to do something about it. And of course, the first thing is you need a catchy name. So we came up with Hepatitis C TLC, the Hep C TLC program, um, test, link, and cure. So we've made great strides in getting access to, to testing for people who are at high risk. Um, our state laboratory, which didn't use to offer hepatitis C testing at all, now offers it through all health departments in the state. Um, linkage to cure, so it's not enough to just find people who are positive. You have to engage them and get them linked in to, uh, to cure. So we now are kind of taking a page from our HIV knowledge um, with bridge counselors, people who take people who are newly diagnosed and make those phone calls or go pick them up and drive them in, you know, do what it takes to get them linked into care. Um, linkage also is, means linking them into the other things that they're going to need to be successful. That could be substance abuse treatment, that could be other social services, et cetera. And um, this is one area where syringe services play a big role. And then cure. As I said, this is now something that's curable. And of course, number one through 99 is you're curing them for themselves. You're preventing a, you know, a, a deadly infection. Um, but it's also important to recognize that you're also curing them for the community, particularly if they are continuing to engage in these high-risk behaviors. If they've been cured, then that's one less person who's capable of transmitting hepatitis C to other people in the community. So that's the hep C approach. Um, and I, didn't, I'm, I don't think I really have a slide about it. We're, we're working now on... Um, some of the other particular infectious complications. Hepatitis B, you know, we're trying to make sure people get the vaccine and that's our immunization branch colleagues have worked to get that out there to the people who need it so that they can be protected. Um, we're also working on endocarditis. Endocarditis is a tough one because you get these people who are stuck in the hospital for these long periods of time. We're trying to figure out how can you use that time that when they're stuck there just waiting to get back out. How can you use that time? And, and we've had some people, um, some of our colleagues in the clinical setting who are trying to come up with some innovative ideas of maybe getting sort of peer counselors in to, to work with those folks and see if there's anything they can do with, with them or for them during that time to prevent them from uh, for getting another infection as soon as they get back out. I think you're going to hear some more about naloxone, um, so I won't dwell on it, but that's another big uh, important part of the solution here when you look at the opioid epidemic. And this map just shows the number of pharmacies with a standing order. Um, in case people don't know what that is, there's, there's a, a, a standing order from our state health director that allows pharmacies to distribute naloxone, which is the reversal agent if somebody's overdosed, that you can give them and, and, and potentially bring them back. So that if they have a standing order, then so anybody can walk in and, and get naloxone without needing a prescription for it. Um, so this is just a map of showing where that is. And I, I know there's pharmacies, don't know how many, here in Dare County that, uh, that do provide naloxone with a standing order. So that's, that's a big step in the right direction. Reversals. Um, it's just a map showing overdose reversals. You know, we don't really have a great way of tracking all the reversals with naloxone that take place. Um, we know that law enforcement is doing a lot of that work, and it's great that our law enforcement agents are, are able to, to have that ability. A lot of reversals are taking place out in the community, but if people don't sort of bother to take the time to go onto the website and log in and tell us about it, uh, we might not know. So it's underestimated, the numbers I was going to show you there. And then, of course, substance abuse treatment. Um, for those who are ready for that is, is, is fundamental to all this. And this is just a map of the uh, substance abuse treatment facilities across the state. Um, so it's, you know, don't want to talk about solutions without including that, which is obviously critically important. Okay, which leads me to uh, syringe exchange programs. Um, so I think people are aware that this is, it's actually fairly new. It feels like, um, I was just commenting earlier, I was, I was with, um, my counterpart from Pennsylvania, and she was sort of bemoaning the fact that they don't have the ability to do syringe exchange in, in Pennsylvania, and what a hindrance as they've tried to uh, address their, their opioid epidemic, which is huge. Um, and it feels like we've had that option forever, but it's only been since July of 2016 that this has been on the table for us. 
Um, so, and syringe services or syringe exchange programs are helpful, and you probably can't read all this, but the point is it's, it, it's a way to accomplish so many things at once. From a disease transmission standpoint, you're giving them clean supplies so that they're not going to be reusing or sharing and spreading some of those infections I was talking about, but it's also a way to engage people in substance abuse or substance use treatment if, if that's something that they're ready for. It's also a way to get some of the, the, um, the reversal, the naloxone, to make sure that people are equipped so that we can start to decrease our overdose deaths. Um, it's a way to get them plugged in to, to testing for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and it's a way to just provide a lot of other key messages about how they can keep themselves healthy and, and what they can do to prevent, um, to keep others healthy too, to prevent the, the spread of any infections. So it's really, uh, it's really critical. And if we, if we didn't have it as an option here in North Carolina, um, we would be in a much worse place than we are in dealing with this growing epidemic. Um, here's just a nice little visual from, uh, from a syringe exchange program. And at the bottom, it's just lists off HIV testing, case management, drug treatment, referrals, healthcare, HIV, hepatitis C prevention. So it, it really is a way to um, sort of tackle so many of these uh, different problems that go along with the, with the opioid epidemic. So here's a little bit of uh, data from the first year since, this, um, since syringe exchange was legalized in North Carolina. And this is already out of, out of date. This is, was just published, but it only goes through July 1st because that was the first one year of having syringe exchange legalized. And you can see there were 21 registered syringe exchange programs. I believe that there are now 26, uh, covering 28 counties. But if you add in the other residents of other counties that are served, it's 52 counties. So this is, this is huge. And of course, Dare County was quick out of the gate um, with this, which is, which is a great thing. There's a lot of white space on this map, a lot of counties where people don't have access, and even if you're in a county that has access, you may or may not live in a location where you functionally have access. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of increasing access to syringe service programs, and I think it's important to acknowledge that it's, it's never gonna be enough. This is never gonna be the one size, or the, the one answer to this. You're, we're, we're really gonna have to figure out other places within our healthcare system and our health departments where we touch people who are dealing with with substance use issues and and uh, you know because there's there's never going to be enough capacity to have uh, access to syringe exchange programs for everyone um, some more of the good news from the first year of reporting for the, uh, the 21 syringe exchange programs statewide, they served almost 4,000 participants um, with 15,000 total contacts. And the contact is every time somebody came in. So um, 4,000 people who made 15,000 different visits over the course of that first year. Um, more than 1 million syringes distributed. And also, um, Almost 500,000 syringes collected, so that's actually pretty good when you compare it with national data in terms of how much was coming back in for how much was going out. Um, more than 5,000 naloxone, the drug reversal agent kits distributed, uh, more than 1,300 referrals made. Um, let's see, what are the other key things here? Almost 4,000 referrals made for substance use disorder treatment, so there's a lot of people, and you know, that's that's pretty close to the number of participants there. So there's a lot of people who need it are, are getting those referrals and finding out how to access the services that they need. And testing for HIV and, and hepatitis C has been a, a huge success through these programs as well. We've gotten um, more than 2,500 people tested for HIV, only 690 tested for HIV directly through these um, syringe exchange programs, but a lot of people also get referred for testing. So that that's, doesn't reflect all the testing that's happened as a result of having people uh, having these syringe exchange programs. Um, I won't go into this, but 
just kind of puts it in context, the syringe exchange or the safe, what's called the uh, Safer Syringe Initiative is just one piece of the state's overall um, opioid action plan. So there's, you know, this, this spans everything from treatment and recovery, which is obviously huge, and healthcare needs, uh, issues with first responders that I think you're going to hear more about, and data and surveillance. So this is just one piece of the puzzle. And as I've already said, it's not going to be the whole story, but this is a really key and important piece, and we're very glad that, that it's an option here. Uh, as for what we do with it, um, and I'm speaking broadly because this is really housed somewhere else within the Division of Public Health, but um, our role is the program sign up through us. I think there's a picture of the, the website here. Um, this is our Safer Syringe Initiative website, so this is where people go when they want to register as a, as a syringe service program. And we are aware that there are other ones out there beyond the ones who have reported to us, but hopefully they will all be signed up um, soon. And, uh, and we give them some technical assistance. We do have some requirements as to the basic things that they need to be providing in terms of education and referrals. Um, we collect reports for them, which I just showed you the results of the first year, but we're going to be able to track over time how we're doing in terms of both um, syringes given out, syringes taken in, also um, testing for communicable diseases, referrals, et cetera. Um, and we encourage partnerships, particularly with our public health departments, since it's, it's really important that, uh, that we forge those partnerships within the communities and, uh, and resource development. We've got if you ever go on that Safer Syringe Initiative site, we've got great information. We have lots of stuff that they can sort of print off and use within, within the um, syringe service program, so a lot of resources available. So that's kind of our role in, in helping to, uh, to facilitate it. Um, okay, so I think that's, I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, I've got my name here, also Lily Armstrong. She's the person in the chronic disease and injury section who works really closely with us, and she's been coordinating the Safer Syringe Initiative and doing an excellent job with that, and she's uh, given me a lot of the slides here today, so uh, I appreciate everything that she's done for this. And um, again, I just want to thank you all for, for your interest in this. I want to thank um, Dare County for being so proactive and, and, uh, and for taking this step to protect the health of your residents, and um, I look forward to hearing questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Zach. That was good, it was very interesting. Um, and again, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, I'm sure a lot of questions come up from the things that he presented. Uh, next, I would like to present Donnie Varnell. Um, many of you know Donnie, um, his, his bio was um, like this long. He, he has um, been there and, and done that and done so many things. Um, but he was with the State Bureau of Investigation for many, many years. He's now retired from there. Um, he works on many state-level communities fighting prescription and opioid drug abuse. He, um, he worked for the NC Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, he um, has set up programs for them. Um, and probably the best thing about Donnie is that he lives in our backyard and we are so lucky to have him. He is a, such a resource and um, I really have enjoyed working with him. So I'm gonna turn it over to Donnie. Thanks. Uh, one, thanks for having me. And I see some familiar faces. Uh, and, and I'll challenge you up front. Uh, the people that are in this room a lot of times, uh, you know, you're the, you're part of the solution. I mean, you come to these meetings. I see some of the same faces. I spoke to you individually. But the challenge that you have is to go out from these meetings and pass this information on to other people. And maybe at the next town hall meeting, you know, we have 100 people we've never seen before. Or, you know, you drag your young people in here because God knows they don't want to come. But let them hear, just let them hear the information. 
we are really fortunate in Dare County uh, for a couple of reasons. One is we have a sheriff that's a Christian, and he's always cared more about other people than he has himself. Uh, Doug Dowdy has always been the law, too, by the way. Uh, and I don't want anybody ever get confused. I get called the hippie cop a lot of places I go because I have worked with all these programs before anybody else heard about them. And, you know, I have, I've always thought I've been a straight-up police officer my whole life. If you needed locking up, I was, the, I was your guy. You know, I, I understood that game really well. Uh, but I think we have found throughout the state uh, that longtime police officers, especially, we realize that we have arrested almost everybody we can arrest. Now, there are still people that absolutely need the traditional enforcement techniques. There's people that are selling narcotics, that are profiting off the misery and addiction of other people, and we still have to approach that in a law enforcement manner, and we have to enforce the law. But what we have found in, in North Carolina, and by the way, uh, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Moore here. His office, those stats that you see up there, they have studies that he didn't have time to show you. And their studies are used across the nation to start other programs. And North Carolina has always been ranked in the top 10 in the nation as being proactive in this problem. So no matter how bad you think it is, and it is bad, by the way, uh, North Carolina has always, even though we're the small southern state, We've always been on the forefront of trying to find solutions to help with the problem. And the reason our solutions work are the reasons you're here. This is normally would have been considered an unusual group to sit in the same place. And in Dare County, we have no problem doing that. If it means helping people, we will put any organizations together and help. And, and that's why we're fortunate here. Uh, like today, I was at the Attorney General's Law Enforcement Steering Committee. Uh, I was fortunate that I was invited, but it's all the attorney generals and the district attorneys and law enforcement, federal, state, and local law enforcement. And we spoke about enforcement action some. You know, there's some things that we're working on. Fentanyl, how to, get, how to get in front of fentanyl. As you heard Dr. Moore say, fentanyl is the number one, is absolutely the number one killer right now. Uh, but what all these criminal justice professionals ended up speaking about, and this is your law enforcement trend, is we started talking about medication-assisted treatment, buprenorphine, methadone. You know, how do we get more clinics, better clinics, better medical care, not, not in and out fast food medication, but people actually having counseling sessions, actually having referrals. You know, how do we fix that? Because as police officers, we know we need that in this equation. Uh, syringe exchange programs, how to make that better and bigger. Uh, and I always want to touch on the myth, you know, there's, there's someone in here, and I guarantee you because I used to be that guy, uh, well, we're just passing out syringes. We might as well pass out heroin with it. I mean, what are we doing? And I will tell you there's no study paid for or done by anybody in the world that will show that a clean syringe made someone start using heroin. At that point, that's already happened. The syringe is now not only a way to keep people from becoming infected or sick, it is that peer-to-peer -peer contact that will help someone find services. You are four to five times more likely to find services or rehab. I hate to use the rehab word because it means so many different things. But you're four to five times more likely to find services if you participate in a syringe exchange program than if you don't. So, I mean, let that see, sink in. I don't know if you saw those numbers, but about 20% of the people that participate in the program were referred to services that normally would have never gone anywhere to get help. So the syringe exchange program, not only does it help our medical world, but it also helps people find services. So we talked about Operation Medicine Drop. We talked about naloxone, how to pay for naloxone because it's not free. Uh, Dare County was the second county in the state that every law enforcement agency carried naloxone. Uh, part of that's because they're the home team, I'll admit. You know, I, I was involved. But we've had 10,000 reversals in three years. And that's not EMS or the emergency room. That is, that is naloxone that we have passed out to one, the public, right? The, the community that uses needs naloxone in their hand and to first responders. So we've had 10,000 reversals in three years. And three years ago, not one, not one police officer in the state carried it. Now, our death rate keeps going up a little bit. What would it be without naloxone? 
And as first responders, the best thing about us has always been we don't care who you are. I, we get a bad rap sometimes. Don't get me wrong. And, of course, we may be cynical and we may, we may talk and say things we're not supposed to sometimes. But when the bell rings, we don't ask how much money you make. We don't ask what kind of car you drive. I don't even care where you went to school. Well, I mean, unless you went to Duke. But, I, but besides that, I mean, we don't care. We get in the car, we turn on the lights and the sirens, and we come to help you. And that means we save your life, we'll save your life. So we don't care. It's the best thing about us. But if we don't have those tools, there's nothing we can do until EMS gets there. So it's important that those bills go through, those bills that will help pay for replacement kits and more naloxone kits go through. So that's why we work on those legislative things. Uh, I think we probably ought to talk about trends and drugs. I think people like that. If we had an eight-hour block today, I would start with the opium wars of 1850 where China and England went to war. And, of course, people think it was to stop opium, just so you get your history right. England went to war with China because they wanted their opium. You give me the opium or we will come to war with you, China. So that's the opium wars. And that's where, you know, we can go back that far at least to start with opium. There's been substances since there's been humans. And we've been trying to figure out a way to stop it ever since then. But in, in Dare County, once you skip alcohol, by the way, and we've got a lot of experts, uh, Dare Casa can talk to us all day about alcohol and tobacco and caffeine. But once you get past that and you get into the law enforcement realm of illicit drug use, in, North, in Dare County, it's marijuana. That's the most common thing that street officers run into. Uh, marijuana is not what it was in the 60s, if anybody was alive in the 60s. Uh, I know at least one guy was. Uh, marijuana back there was about 3% THC. That's the stuff that, that's the active ingredient. And now we routinely see it at 20 up to 25%. And from our wonderful people in Colorado, you know, they have now made marijuana wax and it's 70% sometimes, which is stronger by weight than LSD. So marijuana has actually taken a big jump in the world of illicit drugs, right? It's not, what, it's not like drinking a beer. It's different now. Uh, in Dare County, we have a, a pretty good issue, a pretty big issue with marijuana or THC foods and goodies. Uh, I believe there's, I mean, I don't know the name, and I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but I know that there was a student here that I think walked in the door with a marijuana or a THC lollipop in their mouth. All right, so they'll mix it in things. They don't know how strong it is, and it gets them in trouble. So we see a lot of marijuana. That, that's pretty normal. Pills. Pills are still the number one cause of overdose deaths, although heroin is trying to catch it. With the Bureau, I work constantly on trying to get the overdose death rate down. That's, that was what my function was. I wanted to change that. And we made a lot of regulations and laws and task force, and we made it harder to get illicit or fraudulent prescriptions. We made it harder. I'm not saying we certainly didn't stop it, uh, but we made it harder. And to some extent, part of that, part of what drove heroin is that. Heroin is much cheaper than prescription narcotics on the street. Your pills go for a dollar a milligram. So if you have a 15 milligram hydrocodone, it's worth at least $15 on the street. Dare County is usually a little higher because I don't know if it's the tourist prices or what, but it's a little higher. Uh, so that's really hard to sustain that habit, uh, and we will see people go to heroin. Two years ago, 80% of the people that used heroin told us they started with a, with a legitimate prescription, and it moved into heroin eventually. And now we find that number is starting to fall, and people are going to heroin first. It's becoming a popular drug. Uh, and that should scare us for a lot of reasons. You heard Dr. Moore say heroin is very strong. And you don't know how strong it is when you get it because now they're mixing it with fentanyl. Uh, we did testing in Wilmington. We tested syringes and spoons and burners that the street outreach people were using, that users were using. Uh, we did a lot of testing with testing strips, and 80% of everything we tested had fentanyl in it. Some people knew it was fentanyl. Some people didn't. And I think that's one of the reasons you see such a spike in fentanyl causing overdose deaths is there are people getting it that have no idea what it is. Uh, so fentanyl is a, not only is it on a, a sharp increase, it's a troubling to us because it's causing the deaths. I think that's why we're all in here. We're losing so many people that are close to us. Uh, also, we're having the... Uh, 
uh, carfentanil, you saw that, also AKA Gray Death, it's a really fancy, buzzy name on the internet. We've had 15 confirmed cases in North Carolina, and that means that case actually went to the state lab, it was tested, and it came back as carfentanil. So carfentanil exists. And in, in the substance abuse world, or the chronic use world, anything that's stronger, newer, better, greater, it's just like anything else we purchase, right? We want the faster car, we want the, the better Coca-Cola, and so people are starting to try it, and it is going to be the next problem. Uh, we don't have much trouble in Dare County with synthetics as spice and K2, which are synthetic cannabinoids and synthetic uh, cannathinones. Uh, that's kind of like a, a synthetic, they call it synthetic marijuana. It's not really marijuana, it's a lot closer to speed or ecstasy. But we don't have much problem with that here, and that's a good thing. Uh, so we're mostly weed, uh, marijuana, pills, still big, heroin, and fentanyl. That's what we're seeing uh, the most on the street. Uh, now, the next thing I'm supposed to cover is uh, the 911 Good Samaritan Law. Uh, the way this works is, is this. Let me take this down. Hopefully this will keep working. Uh, and if I point at you, can we agree that you're, you know, you're not a drug dealer or you're not, you're not using or anything? And I'll say I'm not using. So anyway, me and this gentleman, we're partying, right? Because you never party by yourself. Because if you're doing heroin by yourself and you overdose, there's nobody there to save you. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, used to we wouldn't go hunting by ourselves because you fell out of a tree stand and broke your leg. You'd be out in the middle of nowhere by yourself, right? So you always had a buddy. It was the buddy system. Well. Chronic drug use is the same way. I mean, you know, people are smart enough to try not to die. So we're using, and uh, he takes too much. He nods off, and I can't wake him up. Now, I'm on probation. So if I pick up 911 and call for help, remember what I told you about Doug Dowdy? There was a day that Doug Dowdy, every time he got out of the car, somebody got handcuffed, right? <laughs> probably yesterday, by the way. Uh, if Doug Dowdy showed up, what was probably going to happen to me? I'm getting hooked up, right? Now, he's going to call EMS because we're going to save Mr. Moore. I mean, Mr. Woodard. We're going to save Mr. Woodard because, remember, Doug doesn't care how much money Mr. Woodard makes. He doesn't care that he's sick. He doesn't care anything about that. He's going to save his life. But I'm sitting here with a couple of syringes, some heroin bags, a burner, maybe some marijuana off to the side. I'm getting charged. That's how that used to work. So did I call? Probably not. And so what happened to Mr. Woodard? He died. Two things. Either he didn't take enough to die, because we would dip him in cold water, put him in the shower, make him drink coffee, walk him around the front yard. I see some people nodding. <laughs> that doesn't work. He dies cold and wet, or with dirty feet and coffee down the front of his shirt, right? Or he did not take enough to die. It was one or the other. So we, had, we thought, we knew, in, because of our street outreach, we knew we were losing people every year, a lot of people that just didn't call for help. So we passed a Good Samaritan law. It, actually, we had a Good Samaritan law, but we updated it so it was in, the, you know, in our century. And the way it works is this. If I think I have a med medical emergency, we're partying again, he nods off. If I think I have a medical emergency that, that includes an overdose or alcohol poisoning, so who knows a teenager? Yeah, I know some still. Mine are all grown, but I still know teenagers or college kids. So alcohol poisoning, because that's keg parties and drinking parties, right? Or I think I have an overdose emergency. If I call 911 and I give my real name, I don't know why that's important, but it is. I have to use my real name. I can't use my astronaut name I use, I guess. Uh, and I say, hey, medical emergency, help me. 911, come help me. When they come, and Doug Dowdy's the first one there, because, by the way, police can almost always get to the scene first because we're in our cars, right? I mean, we're already on the street, especially in rural areas, Hyde County, Terrell County, Camden. Those people, we almost always can get there first. If I've gotten the locks on, that's a good thing. So when they get there, they're going to do rescue for Mr. Woodard or me, whichever one of us has nodded off. And in the Good Samaritan Law, Neither of us can be charged with possession up to one gram of heroin or cocaine. We cannot be charged with drug paraphernalia or any alcohol possession charges. It will not affect my probation, my parole, or my pretrial release. 
Now, is that a get out of jail free card? No, it, no, it's not. Because I mean, people go, well, we're just letting them get away with it. Well, we're not. What we're really trying to do is save Mr. Woodard, right? And if I've got a sawed off shotgun laying on the kitchen table and I have a kilo of meth sitting on the couch, it doesn't cover that, right? That's if I've got seven stolen TV sets in the back bedroom, it doesn't protect me from any of that stuff. What it really does is we're trying to get help from Mr. Woodard. Now, did it work? Well, the only place that we did the full study at was Wilmington. And one year, we have 250 911 calls for overdose. We passed a law. A year later, we have 450 calls for 911 drug overdose. Now, is all that the Good Samaritan law? I don't know. I mean, but it is some of that. Because we know it took about 60 days for the street people that were using to even believe that was the truth. Because Wilm Wilmington PD was pretty aggressive about law enforcement activity when they got to these kind of scenes. So they wouldn't call even then. So it took about two months for them to believe. So the Good Samaritan Law, if you don't hear anything else in here tonight, and there's a ton of great information coming, tell a young person <laughs> that if they're in trouble with drugs at a place or somebody's in trouble drinking alcohol, they can call for help and it's not going to get them arrested, right? And, that's a good, and that is basically the Good Samaritan Law. That's all it is. You can call for help, real name, <laughs> real name, and basically you, can't, basically you have limited immunity from low-level drug offenses, and that way we think it, we get more people saved with naloxone. Are you okay with that? Are you good with that? Because I can go on. You know that, right? All right. That's all I'm going to give you tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Donnie. Um, that was really good, as usual. Thank you very much. Um, next, we're going to um, meet Pastor Frank Lassen. And and Rebecca Paulson. Um, Pastor Frank, um, he started the Source Church in 2011. And... Um, he has started the, uh, the syringe exchange program, um, I guess it was September in 2016, um, Donnie, um, met with Frank and the, the church, and then, um, we all had a meeting at the health department, and, um, that was the, really the start of the relationship that we have with them, um, what they do, um, for the community with the syringe exchange program is wonderful. Um, he has a right-hand person, Rebecca. Um, she's really the coordinator of the program. She's the boots on the ground. She's the one who makes it happen. Um, I can't say enough great things about both of them. Um, we've learned a lot from them, and I think, um, and vice versa, you know, we've, we've taught each other. So I'm going to um, turn it over to them to come up here and um, tell us um, what they do with the syringe exchange program, specifically in Dare County. So, right. <laughs> and I too am gonna move out because uh, this is almost as tall as I am. But uh, so, so we've noticed, man, we've gone from a, a doctor to, uh, to my man who says he's a hippie cop to a, uh, to a short tattooed midget. So it, this is just going downhill. We got degrees, criminal justice degrees, and I got a GED. So to God be the glory, we'll, we'll go and rock this, amen. But, uh, but man, a uh, few things I wanna do. I wanna start off with uh, reading you guys just a few things. It's all a waste of time because they're a waste of life. They do it to themselves, they're junkies, who really cares? Let them get hepatitis C, let them get HIV, let them OD, they all deserve to die anyway. This is just some of the short uh, emails, uh, text messages, letters um, that we'll get, Facebook posts that we'll get about our uh, uh, High Life 252 needle exchange. Our uh, response to it is always something like this. They deserve to live, they deserve very much to live, and even do you do with all of your ignorance. They also deserve a chance to be healthy in the process of living. They are not a waste of time. 
And that's why we will make the time to love on them and help them live and not die. We will not help them to be an addict or a drug user, however you want to call them. But we will help them live through the war of addiction. They are not a waste of life, for life himself went to the cross just for them. So, they, so therefore, we will also go to the streets and the gutters or wherever it is that they may be. They are not junkies. They are someone's son, daughter, mom, dad, brother, or sister. And one day it could even be you. And as far as dying, when I read the Bible, it says that we all deserve to die. For the wages of sin is death. But God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So please don't think that we can escape the death on our own because we're sinless. The only difference between the addict and the gossiper is that the addict accidentally kills himself from time to time. But the gossiper is a murderer to whoever he spreads his hate to. And the listening ear, well, that's his accomplice. So what we have to begin to, hey, hallelujah. <clears throat> so what we have to begin to get into, man, is, is understand when we see something that we don't like or we see something that we don't understand, we can't automatically just be against it. We have to begin to look at uh, 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 statistics. We have to look at facts and, and understand that it's not always our opinion. And that's what it is that uh, I've been blessed with the relationships that we have gathered, man, because these are people who are 100% behind us, 100% supporting us in going forward with what it is that we are doing in High Life 252, and it's absolutely amazing. Again, man, um, we uh, uh, talked about this on, on August 31st at our church, and, and which is uh, Overdose Awareness Day. And then we, from there, man, uh, uh, we had an awesome opportunity to reach out to, uh, to Donnie Varnell. He got us linked up with Roxanne at the uh, health department. And ever since then, man, our relationship with them has been phenomenal. They've uh, blessed us with uh, naloxone. They've blessed us with uh, supplies that we hand out. When we give out kits, man, we have... Um, Clean needles, we have uh, uh, burners, we have cotton, we have alcohol swabs, we have uh, sterilized water. And so we, uh, uh, we birthed this in 2016, and ever since then, man, it, it, we're picking up the pace. We're, growing, we're learning so much every single day, and it's awesome that uh, uh, we will never get to where it is that we plateau, but that we will learn new things all the, all the stinking time, so we love it. Why did we do this? Because we are not naive that in our community we have a drug issue here in Dare County. We also did this because in Leviticus 19.16 it says this, don't just stand by when your neighbor's life is in danger. I am God. So why do it? Because God told us not to just stand by when our neighbor's life is in danger. And if we could just simply look out of our windows, we could see how often our neighbor's lives are in danger. So we knew that we had to do something. We had to act. We no longer wanted to just sit around and talk about the issue. We indeed wanted to act and move on the issue that's taking place. For far too long, I believe that the church has expected the broke, busted, the disgusted, the hurting, lost, dazed, the confused. We've expected the backslider, the, the sinner, and the addict to come into the church to learn how to change their lives, if you would. But as a true follower of Christ, man, we have to grab a hold of Scripture and understand he didn't call them to come in. He sent us to go out. So what we have to begin to do is be willing to go out and meet them in the same gutter as it is that they may overdose in or begin to nod off in. And because of that, that's how High Life 252 came about. And then praise God for Holy Spirit because he began to then connect us with these amazing people up here on this panel. I mean, it blows me away. I love to see people's jaws drop when I mention me, who, who, who looks like I look, and I mention uh, uh, Wally Overman. They're like, you know what I mean? It's awesome. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, sometimes I'll just throw his name out. I want to cut in line, uh, Wally Overman. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just so cool to me, man. So, it, but, but the response, the response from, uh, uh, from these people have been phenomenal. The, the response from, from our sheriff, from, from uh, other uh, uh, law enforcement agencies have been phenomenal. The uh, uh, response from the community is getting more ph phenomenal. The response from the churches, <clears throat> <clears throat> praise the Lord, we're believing that it's going to get more phenomenal in Jesus' name. But uh, we understand that not everyone is for it, and I get it. People get scared. They get concerned. They hear myths or rumors or whatever it may be, so I understand that. But why still do it? Because we believe that people's lives are more valuable than people's opinions. 
So we want to do what it is that we can do to begin to help save people's lives in one way, shape, or another. So a needle exchange, it allows us, it allows us to uh, uh, um, have a one-on-one -on -one opportunity with the drug user, with the person who, who is battling an addiction. It gives us that opportunity, man, to sit down, even if it's just for a few seconds or a few minutes, it gives us the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And in that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, man, we want to begin to learn how we can better serve them. We want to learn how we can better love on them. We want to develop a, a real raw relationship with them so that we can uh, uh, let them know how worthy and loved they are when, uh, uh, when they may be feeling like they're not. What's awesome, we had a, a gentleman in that is a participant in our program, and um, I recently had a, uh, we adopted a new baby girl up in Virginia, and when we were in a hospital, um, this gentleman who's part of our program, his uh, girlfriend uh, gave birth, and they were in the same hospital with us, and it was dope to see him with, with what he was going through, but to instantly be comforted because he just saw a familiar face. We didn't talk all the time, but every time he came into the program, man, we loved on him. We always made sure before he left, man, that he knew how worthy he was, that he knew how uh, righteous he was. We always made sure that we got the opportunity to pray for him. So our intention is and always has been and always will be to love on people. To let, hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> to let them know, man, despite what they're going through, they are awesome and Jesus loves them. This is an amazing platform that, that the Lord has given us. Part of our High Life 252 crew, man, isn't just the clean needle exchange, man, but we also go out in the streets and, and we go out uh, to parks and Cartwright Park and the Park and Wan Cheese and, and we'll hit streets in uh, Wan Cheese and up and down the beach and Manio and we'll, we'll pick up dirty syringes that uh, we get reports that are on the streets. So we don't just give them out, but if we find out that they're getting dumped out, then we want to make sure that we send out our people to, to get out there and do what it is that we need to do to make sure we get them off the streets. And we stress the importance to anybody and everybody that comes into our program to, give, to bring back the dirties. We just had a, a woman who is a peer exchanger bring me 206 needles on Friday. You know what I'm saying? So people are grabbing a hold of this. Uh, uh, Rebecca, praise the Lord for her, who uh, uh, did our numbers. Now, we have a 71% return rate. That's unheard of. But it's amazing what begins to take place when you let somebody know how worthy and how loved they are. When you begin to pour into them, they're going to want to do things that help. As a matter of fact, that lady who's a peer exchanger told me when she brought me the 206 needles, she says, this makes me feel good. It makes me feel as if I'm helping you guys since you guys are out there helping others. So amazing things begin to take place in this program. And I love how uh, uh, Mr. Donnie, uh, Officer Donnie, man, uh, uh, commented on how people think, well, yeah, if you, you, know, you give a syringe, then you might as well give them heroin. It's like giving them a loaded gun. Praise the Lord. And what's crazy, man, is uh, we hear that all the time. I can't tell you, man, we, we've been accused of just going around to playgrounds and, and throwing out syringes to anybody and everybody who's out there. I promise you. We do not do that, right? It's crazy. However, what we do do, I don't want to say that too fast, but uh, what we do is we see to it that anybody who comes in and needs it, then yes, 100%, they get what it is that they need. So when we say things like uh, um, all you're doing is, 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 is putting themselves in more danger, no, what we don't want is for them to stab themselves in the arm with a needle that eventually looks like a pitchfork. What we don't want them to do is get hepatitis C, HIV, or, or any of those infections that, uh, uh, that our doctor, man, uh, Dr. Moore, was talking about. That's what we don't want. Do we want people to be addicted to anything? No. I don't want people to be addicted to, to heroin. I, I don't want people to be addicted to food or, or TV. But we know that it happens. So if we could do anything and, and everything in our power to do something to help, that's what we have to do. I heard a quote one time say that you can't do everything, but you can do everything that you can do. And that's what it is that we have to do. What we can do is what we're going to do. And I tell people all the time, if you don't like it, understand. But please do something. You don't have to do what we do. You don't have to like what we do. But you have to do something. 
So what I want to, to get across to people is we're not out just throwing out syringes. We're not out just throwing out condoms and burners and tourniquets and, and anything else. People uh, uh, seek us. People call us. And or if we know of somebody who's struggling, yes, indeed, we'll seek them and we'll call them. Because we want to see to it that they get the help that they need. And when people say that we encourage drug use, that the High Life 252 program encourages drug use, understand it's silly. That's like saying that Jesus encouraged alcoholism because he turned water into wine. That's stupid. What Jesus did when he turned water into, into wine was he used a platform to show off his deity. He used a platform to show off who he was and the amazing things that it is he could do, not to everybody who was there, but to his 12. And when, what we're doing when we do what it is that he's allowing us to do is we are showing them that there is a better high in him. We have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. We're showing them that there is a better high in, them than the, in him than the high that they are used to. And that's the main purpose of this. We don't, to do nothing, if people say that what we do encourages drug use, then to do nothing would encourage death. To do nothing would mean that, that we're encouraging laziness and, and encouraging a lack of compassion. So what I want us to remember again is remember, it's not our opinion. It's the facts. And like uh, uh, Mr. Donnie said, man, four to five times more likely they will come to seek help. And we saw this in our exchange program. We see people, and, and, and I'll get into numbers here in just a second, but we see people who have uh, coming in not wanting to talk to us at all, wanting to hurry up and get out, to coming back, man, wanting help to get set free from their addictions. We have an awesome opportunity to hand out naloxone. We've handed out close to 300 kits of naloxone. And what's awesome, man, is we have spouses coming, we have parents coming, we have kids coming because their parents are the ones who are addicted. This is amazing what the Lord has allowed us to do. We tell the, tell the officer first law. We tell about the good Samaritan law. We do on-site, whether it's mobile or at the church, man. We do on-site uh, HIV and hepatitis C testing. Because all we want to do, man, is to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. We provide counseling and, and rehab options that we will take people to if indeed they decide to go. We have a small group that meets on Mondays, Freedom and Recovery, man, that we try to get them to get plugged into. But again, most importantly, we have the opportunity to sit down with each person that is part of our participants. Love them, tell them their worth, and show them Jesus Christ. High Life 252's headquarters, man, it's Source Church, or indeed it's mobile, which we thought honestly would be the most popular uh, uh, but what we found is that most of our participants are actually more comfortable coming to the church than us coming to them, I guess, because they think maybe we're going to bring the SWAT team with us. Praise the Lord. But indeed, so they, they most of them come to the church. But what's the coolest thing to me, man, is throughout this program of High Life 252, it has showed me some, um, or I've had the opportunity to meet some amazing men, some amazing women who are actually inspirational but yet they're just at war. They're not junkies. They're battling. They're not, they're not a worthless or lifeless. They're very much worthy and very much full of life. They just need somebody to help them indeed to be transformed in Jesus' name. And that's what it is that we're there for. Lord, put this on our hearts to bless our community. He told me a long time ago that if we take the ones that nobody wants, then indeed he'll send us the one everybody wants. And what we've noticed is it's the same exact people. So people ask why I'm compassionate. Why am I so passionate about this situation? I'll give you three names. Elias Graham, Grayson Smith, and Everby Ray. Now those names might not mean much to you, but they mean everything to me. Because they're my three adopted kids, and all three of them were born addicted to heroin and other drugs. <clears throat> and it's a miracle, it's a miracle that they weren't born with hepatitis C and or HIV. So as I close, I'm going to ask you guys, I, I love congregation participation. And see, my sis messed up when she gave a pastor a microphone, praise the Lord. <laughs> but, uh, but if you guys could do this for me, man, I need eight people to stand up. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> seven, eight. You two can sit down. I'm going to steal you guys in a second. Uh, 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 just what? Uh, you can sit down. Perfect. Awesome. So there's eight. Now I want you guys to look around. These eight people, and, and, and throughout this whole thing, stay standing. These eight people represent, out of the participants that we have in High Life 252, eight people represent, out of all of them, the people who started coming to church simply because they began to come to this High Life 252 program. That's awesome to me. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, well, that's only beneficial to you. Okay, well, I'll give you that one. But check this out. <laughs> if I could have ten people stand up, and we'll go here first. One, two, three. Come on. Yes, sir. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hallelujah. These ten people represent the people who have given their life to Christ Jesus because of the program. That's beneficial to everybody. Most importantly, it's beneficial to the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Now I need 16 people to stand up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, hallelujah. These 16 people, man, represent people who are no longer using our program because they have stopped using heroin and they've gone and seeked medical help. Praise the Lord. Now I need 17 people to stand up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Give me one more, my man in that awesome suit. 17, hallelujah. 17 people, man, represent the number of people that we have sent to detox. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. And what's awesome is I need, we don't have enough. Praise the Lord. So what we'll do is, one, two, three. Y'all stay, stay, stay standing. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, If I didn't count you guys, would you guys be seated? So everybody right here except you two wonderful ladies. Now here's what's cool, and this is besides the salvations because I love salvation. But uh, besides salvation, I think this is one of my favorites. If we look around, these are the amount of funerals that we didn't have because of the 36 reversals that we have coming out of the church. That's phenomenal. <laughs> First and foremost, all glory to God. Second of all, to God be the glory. And you guys may be seated. You guys rock. And second of all, to God be the glory for these amazing people upon this panel that has helped us do what it is that the Lord has put inside of us. And because, first Christ, second, your community and the people that serve it and the people that run it have loved us enough to want to stop the deaths. That's amazing. So, Father God, we thank you, Jesus. God, we praise you. We love you. You're amazing. You're awesome. You're phenomenal. And we thank you that you love us. And, Lord, let us to love your people the way that it is that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. I can join us, Now, listen, people go and joke and say he took up all the time. She didn't want to talk. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Oh, honestly, but the, the, uh, thank you for giving all of that information. My heart really is in this. Um, I've lost countless friends to overdose, um, and now I'm starting with the endocarditis. I've lost my best friend, and I lost a friend recently, very dear to me. So that's my heart in it. This stuff is real. In the past year, I've gone to nine funerals, so it is really real, and I just want to thank everybody in here for helping. Thank you, um, Pastor Frank and Rebecca. That was great. Thank you. 
Next, I want to introduce uh, Debbie Dutton and Wendy Hall, and they're going to talk about the health department's role in um, syringe exchange programs and um, what we're doing in Dare County. Um, Debbie has been um, with Dare County Health Department since uh, 1991, so there's a lot of years of experience here, and um, she most recently became our clinical nursing director in 2015, so we're very lucky to have her on board with this. With her is uh, Wendy Hall. Wendy has been with the health department many years, too, um, and most recently, since 2011, she's been our communicable disease nurse, um, which is huge with the opioid epidemic, um, as Zach referred to. So um, Wendy really is, uh, she's the expert. She's the person that we call and we look to and we have questions. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to both of them. Thank you. And get your slides back up. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to be here tonight. And uh, I really want to thank Roxana for allowing us to follow these three awesome speakers. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> but that's OK. We're here, and we're glad to be here. And uh, we want to share current data with you, maybe some more local data. Um, we want to share with you our screening efforts that we're able to do at the health department and, of course, our role um, within public health. So um, it's estimated that 3.2 million people across the United States are infected with hepatitis C. Like Zach said, the majority of these people are not even aware that they're infected. So why is that? Probably because they aren't tested. Why don't they get tested? Maybe they don't have symptoms, so they don't feel the need to be tested. Um, they may lack the resources for screening. They may have financial barriers, uh, transportation barriers. Um, maybe it's just they're at risk for hepatitis C, but maybe it's just the fear, the fear of the unknown, and maybe they just choose not to be tested. But the reality is that 16,000 people die from hepatitis C across the United States each year. So this is certainly something that needs to be addressed. We need to talk about it and we need to know what to do um, to prevent the transmission of hepatitis C. So because of the increased incidence uh, and the rise in hepatitis C, particularly due to the injection use amongst, um, amongst individuals, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, along with the North Carolina State Lab of Public, of, um, Public Health, started an initiative last spring in 2017 to allow local health departments to screen for hepatitis B or hepatitis C free of charge. So this has been a tremendous um, effort. You can see over the last few years how we have increased our testing, our screening for, of individuals for hepatitis C. Four years ago, we did three hepatitis C screenings for the entire year. The year after that, we did eight. In 2016, we did 12. And this past year, with the availability of free screening, we've done 40 screenings um, for individuals through the local health department. So that is great. That, that is great news. So with the um, raising awareness of this issue, with the rise in hepatitis C that we know we're experiencing, and with the availability of free screenings, our hope is that more people will be tested for hepatitis C. So um, locally, within the past year, um, these are just some numbers that have been reported to the health department. Um, prior to 2016, Hepatitis C was not a reportable disease. Um, in 2016, acute hepatitis C has become reportable. And just a few months ago, in the fall of 2017, chronic hepatitis C is now a reportable disease. So these are um, positive hepatitis C tests that have been reported to the health department 
um, in 2017. And like, like Zach was talking about earlier, there's a difference between chronic hepatitis C and acute hepatitis C. Chronic hep C, these individuals, we don't know when they were infected. They could have been, been infected for years. Um, but in 2017, these individuals have been screened either through the health department or through um, local agencies that have been reported to the local health department or to the state health department. We have a record of, my slide says, six hepatitis C individuals. We got a recent um, report just a few days ago. There are five more hepatitis C cases since then. So for 2017, we have 15 or 11 positive hep C cases. We have six positive hep B cases, and we have one new infection of HIV. The state has a reporting system that um, keeps track of all the reportable diseases that, that come into the local health departments and come into the state. And this is called NCEDS. It's the North Carolina Electronic Disease Surveillance System. And like I mentioned earlier, prior to 2016, hepatitis C was not a reportable disease. But um, since then, especially um, a few months ago when they started um, reporting chronic hepatitis C, there's been a huge backlog of numerous cases that have not yet been reported to the state. So the information that is available to us is really not the most accurate information. There's so much more work that needs to be done to get our systems up and to get all the information um, put into our system. So what we know locally for acute hepatitis C in 2016, we have had no reported cases. Like Zach mentioned, those are just the cases that are reported to us. That doesn't mean there are no acute hepatitis C cases out there. It's just that none have been reported. These people are not being tested, or they just have not been reported to, um, to the state health department. So in 2017, we have following the same trend. We have no reported cases of hepatitis C, acute hepatitis C. But looking at the data for our chronic hepatitis C, um, the system is reporting that Dare County currently has just over 100 cases. Um, the system has not been in place long enough to really track trend data, nor has it been in place long enough for us to really have an impact, to know what the impact is to our community. But this gives us a baseline. So moving forward, as more cases are reported, as we're able to upload all the backlog of cases that the positives that we are aware of, this will give us better data moving forward in the future. So we will know where we are, where we are heading. Okay. So what is our role in public health? Our role is multifaceted. First of all, we want to continue our efforts for screening. And as long as the state continues to support that effort and provides um, us the ability to do the screening, um, we will be able to offer that. So just raising awareness to the community that that service is available, that's just huge to get, to get individuals in for the screening that they need. When we do receive um, positive results, then that's our opportunity opportunity to get these individuals into treatment. We can refer them to care. They need primary care. Many of these individuals don't even have a primary care provider to manage their daily medical issues. We can refer them to specialty care. These individuals need medications. They need management of their disease um, to, follow, to follow them through the, the, the progress and like um, was mentioned earlier, hepatitis C can be cured, so we can stop the disease from progressing. Many of these individuals need referrals to mental health, and of course those who are substance users may need referrals for substance abuse. So that, um, that is one role that we can help to facilitate to get these folks moved in the right, in the right direction. Um, counseling and control measures. That is another huge piece that the health department is able to do. 
when an individual comes in and they test positive for hep C, they need encouragement, they need education, they need to understand how this disease progresses. They need to um, be linked to treatment and be linked to care. We want them to um, have that ability, access to care so they can receive the medications and the treatments that they need. We need to educate them on um, many of these individuals engage in risky behaviors. How can they reduce those risks so that they have um, hopefully healthier outcomes and better quality of life? We um, offer control measures. We teach them how to prevent the transmission, further transmission of hep C. That is our goal, to get these individuals healthy and to prevent further transmission. Um, update immunizations. These individuals are at risk for other illnesses and diseases um, besides just the hepatitis C that they come in with, um, especially vaccine preventable diseases. So we can take this opportunity to give them the immunizations that they need, in particular hep A and hep B to prevent um, further infections. And I'm going to skip, I'm going to go down to assisting individuals um, to getting them into care. There are patient assistance programs, there are medication assistance programs available that we can link these individuals to the financial needs. Many individuals don't have health insurance, don't have the financial means to seek care, so we can link them to those services. Um, and finally, it's very important to get these individuals linked to a syringe exchange program. Um, it's important for these folks to have access to clean needles and clean supplies. The um, relationship that we have with the Source Church has been phenomenal. Um, we've been able to provide Hep B or Hep C rapid test kits and HIV test kits. Um, they are able to do those tests those screenings on site. If they have any individuals that test positive, they can refer them back to the health department. We can do further testing for confirmation. We can get them um, referred uh, to the proper health care professionals. We can provide them with the counseling, the education, and the control measures they need. So it has just been a tremendous opportunity for us to expand our public health role in the community by uh, working with the Source Church and really taking care of so many needs um, within our own community. That's, that's what we do. Um, you know, it's important um, to stop the, the spread, the transmission of disease, um, promote healthy lifestyles, get these folks into remission, um, to promote healthy outcomes, and um, just this issue needs our attention and your attention as well. Do you have anything to add? I just, this is my, <laughs> this, is, this is the CD expert. I just, I, we know that there's hepatitis C in the community and especially with the individuals that do um, use IV drugs. So it is, I think this needle exchange program is so important and um, I really appreciate everybody's support. So it's been a great, great experience. Thank you, Debbie and Wendy. That was good. Thank you. Um, before we move into questions, um, I thought I would turn it over to a few minutes here to um, our sheriff, um, Doug Dowdy, who's um, sitting in the crowd here to share a few comments and thoughts. Dare County looked after me and uh, bought me bigger chairs that didn't have the, um, the rails on the side of it because every time you get up with a gun on, you pick up the chair and walk with it, you know, wherever you go. That was not the case, and I almost didn't make it out of the chair. Um, you know, Frank, uh, Pastor Frank, he, he, uh, he kind of stole my thunder. Um, you know, what he said right at the beginning of, of what he talked about was, that you can't stand by and do nothing. You know, you can talk about people that try to do something. You can talk about everybody that's trying to figure out what they're doing. 
everybody's going to talk about everybody, and I wish Facebook would blow up and never, ever come back again. I, it's got some really good things that happen with it, but mostly it's a, I believe it's a demon that just walks around through us, and it, most people don't even need to read it because it can sure affect your whole life. Um, but we do see some good things on there. But I call, I started one time when I talked about Pastor Franklin. I don't really know where we were uh, when I told him, but I had never really met him, and I wanted to see him. And I told him, I said, um, how many people in here have seen the movie Braveheart? Yeah, well, that's what I told him he was. I said, uh, he's a lot like William Wallace. I saw all the tattoos, you know, and when they were getting ready to fight one of those final battles. You know, he was talking, they were talking about, he was talking about himself, and he said, you know, I know you think I do this and I do that, and you're expecting this great big man, you know, he could even shoot uh, lightning bolts out of somewhere he shouldn't be shooting them out of. But that's the kind of man, you know, I find him to be. He's a believer in the fact that you can do and change anything. Um, and that makes a difference. You know, he's trying. Donnie Vernell, um, he talks about a doctor. I have been in Dallas, Texas with him. His initials are D.R. Varnell. So he signed his name, D.R. Varnell. The guy at the desk said, welcome, doctor. And I was proud to be with him. So he doesn't have a degree, but <laughs> we, we, we moved along pretty well in the line anyway. So he, he knows how to get by. He's a very educated man, and you can tell he knows his stuff, and uh, he makes my job and our job a lot easier. And I don't have to go a lot of places because he does that for me, and he puts out a very, very good word, and is very, very informative about what he does. But to, to go back to it, it, it's the fact that, we, you know, Dare County is – where they are because we tried to do something. Now, we may not be right in everything we do, but we're at least not doing nothing. Um, and that makes all the difference in the world. I, I went, why they call Donnie a hippie cop is because we ended up in Raleigh, and I declare everybody that was there, I was waiting to see Woodstock break out. Um, and, you know, and they were surely not talking about arresting anybody. And everything that lady had said, and I had watched two or three sheriffs get up and go out, and when I went out, I found out there was about seven or eight of us out there. And we, we had all we could take. You know, we were done. But, you know, he listened, and he's able to put another word on that that people understand. And he's made a lot of police officers and a lot, a lot of sheriffs in the state of North Carolina take heed to what he's talking about. And when he talked about it here to us, you know, we knew right off if we were going to do one piece of it when you asked the right question about that, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to have this, you know, program? Every, everything that goes along with it kind of falls in place. You can't do one without the other. You can't take a piece of a puzzle and not give you the rest of the pieces to put the puzzle together. You'll never get through with finishing the puzzle. And I think that's what's made him so believable. You know, he has the gift of gab, and he knows how to present it, and people listen. You know, they like what he has to say, um, you know, and the best thing about it is he tried. Um, I'm just going to, you know, like I said about Pastor Frank, he's got a very, very good word. And what they have done, you know, I never believed they would make the difference that they are making. But he's phenomenal in what he does. And the best part about it is he believes it. And I heard the governor of North Carolina say that it's never going to work. This, the opioid problem will never get anything done with it unless, unless it is with, through the faith-based community because you watch people every day struggle and they'll give you anything in the world you can do but unless you've got something you can turn back on in the end that you know you can I mean you you can't talk to me at four o'clock in the morning you can't if you call me you can talk to God at four o'clock in the morning if you're in trouble and you don't have to pick up a telephone to do it you've got to have faith in something that will listen to you and you know it's there and you can do it anytime you need to do it and people aren't, the pe you know, people cannot do it. They're not there. So God gives you that outlet. God said himself in Isaiah 55, 11, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Now, if you don't think that's what they're doing, if they're not preaching the word and putting that word to effect in everything they do when they do it with this program, then you are sadly mistaken. And it may not be all right, 
but it certainly isn't all wrong, and it certainly is making a difference, and it makes people believe that wouldn't have believed it in the first place. I'm proud of everything that Dare County has done, and I know sometimes that we fall short and we may not do it, every bit of it exactly right, but we're not sitting back in the back row, we're on the front row, and we're trying to do what we believe is right, and everybody in here that believes in that, you can see a difference in what is going on and what is taking place. I know we're doing a good enough job where they say well, we can't meet. I have six people in my drug unit. You know, we entice people to come to Dare County and, you know, sell to people here. Or We don't entice it, but we, we are able to put a stop to it by using informants and stuff that, you know, ordinarily buy, and those people come over. They will not anymore come into Dare County. They will tell us that they will meet us in Curry Tuck, but that the law is too tight in Dare County to come and deal drugs because you will go to jail. Now, that makes a difference. You know, so I'm very proud of the guys that do that and girls that do that every day because they are truly making a difference. So when we're fighting it from a number of fronts, we will definitely continue to see a difference in what we're doing. And just like the man said, if we only save one life, we've saved that life. The doctor said a while ago, and, that, and I have wondered about this with the endocarditis. Is that what you said? I know a couple of people that you know have made it through it. And I, I'm you know very pleased that they were able to do that. And you were saying you know how many times can you repair? You know I'm wondering how many times you can restart a heart. But that still won't make me give up on the fact that you know if we get there we're going to use Narcan. But I don't have, you know, I've seen some kids that, you know, have already, you know, gone and come back four and five times. And it's amazing to me that they're still here. I just don't know how many times that you can do that. So sooner or later, if it's not through a faith-based community or something of that sort, we're going to lose them one way or the other. But right now, we're making a difference, and that's all we can ask for. Thank you for your time, and thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to open it up now to any questions that may be, um, okay, great. How many needles are being exchanged in, a, say, a month or a week? So, I mean, you know, you could have somebody who's going to come in and who, who is the uh, addict themselves, and they may come in, and uh, what we begin to do is ask them their availability of getting back to us. So uh, generally, if it's somebody who's a first time, or they'll come in, and, and they're kind of open up a little bit about their addiction, and they're asked for a few needles. So I say, so you, you want three needles? So my thing is, well, when are you going to be able to get back to me? Because I don't want you to use three needles if you're shooting up three times a day, and you can't get back to me till next week. Because I don't, if I give you a needle, I want you to use that needle one time and then disregard that needle and use a clean needle the next time. So it just depends on who the person is and how much it is that they're using. So generally you could say if somebody comes in and they could come to me weekly, so they take a 10 pack. But then I'm going to have somebody who is a peer exchanger, who, which is somebody who's going to go out and begin to distribute needles to people who they know are using but won't come in to see us yet. So I might give them 50, 60, 70 to go out there and distribute, and then they turn around and bring me those needles right back. So it just, weekly it's going to depend. There's not like a set number on how many is going out or how many is coming in. I wouldn't say, uh, uh, hey, praise the Lord. I wouldn't say that there's 200 needles going out a week. Um, but maybe maybe 100 needles a week, and, and then you're going you're gonna to hit times that uh, we might do 200 needles a week, 300 needles a week, and then we're going to do a time that it's like, man, we've only given out 50 needles this week. You know what I'm saying? So, um, hey, praise the Lord. And uh, what we also do is each person that comes in, we give them a sharps container. So when they get needles, they also get a sharps container. So when they use that, they dispose of it. So... <laughs> Not to try to tiptoe around your question, it, it would, I would have to go back and look at numbers to make an average on how much it is that we're giving out a week. I would say some weeks, yeah, no doubt, probably 200. Um, and then other weeks, man, it might be 10. So. Or maybe 
I will tell you that it's going to be a case by case basis around here in most uh, jurisdictions, unless you know something different, major. It's going to be case by case. Usually, the, that person is going to be turned over to EMS because training for law enforcement is you are a rescue person, you're doing a rescue kit, and you know EMS always rolls because we're not EMS. So EMS may give them that information. I know that Rebecca. Uh, and other people from the Saving Lives Task Force have worked on packets to give out to people uh, at the ER. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, I know that we, I don't want to talk about what other people should be doing or are doing, but I know that there's a work, a plan in the works where EMS will start leaving stuff at the residence. We'll leave another kit and leave information. Uh, so I guess the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. But there, I don't think there's a standard that we have a packet that we pass out. I think we see about a 50%, uh, at least that's what the, the uh, street officers from the different agencies are telling me, is that about 50% refuse, about 50% go. Uh, and that's kind of the average. There's some towns, uh, I know Nashville, North Carolina, and Nash County have about a zero rate of going to the hospital almost everybody refuses uh, but you know that's that's the law also once you're once you're coherent and can make a decision you can refuse medical treatment and there are Fayetteville has Fayetteville and Guilford County have started a program where like three days later uh, after the crisis is over a team of a peer and a medical or social worker will go back to the residence we used to send police officers uh, but to be honest with you, that was a pretty poor plan because when the cops show up, there's a lot of houses that won't, do not want a police officer on the front porch uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons. Uh, but uh, there, those two places have start, started programs where like three days later, they'll put a peer team together and they'll go back to the residence and really do a more one-on-one -on -one thing. And they have much better success than that's a crisis situation. Maybe crisis intervention can help, but it's... I don't know how conducive that talk is at that moment. But every overdose that occurs in Derry County, whether it's in a time or in the county itself, one of my drug guys do go by or two do go by and make sure that something that people are not doing in the highest individual that OD or they are there and we can look at him, we will have to talk to him too. My guys do a really good job of making sure you know that. Everything that they can do will be done, and it's you know a matter of you know they're wanting to talk to that particular point in time, especially you know if it was hot up, really messed them up, or how they actually got, and you can do this and that We can offer them a place to go, you know they won't be charged, but we can offer them help to get them somewhere, or you know sometimes we just offer them to tell them you know the individual that might have you know supplied them to stuff, what whatever we can do to you know make that you know better for them. And better for us, and we may be able to stop it than we actually did that. But we do know about everyone that's before. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Roxana. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again for your attendance here tonight. Uh, I hope you found the information that you heard interesting and helpful to you. Uh, if you are inclined to become active in these efforts, I would invite you to attend a meeting of the Saving Lives Task Force. Um, we meet monthly and information and a link uh, to our meetings can be found on the Dare County website uh, and on the Saving Lives Task Force Facebook page. Uh, please plan to attend the additional town hall presentations uh, we will offer this year. There will be three, uh, three additional ones, uh, and we will have those at different locations throughout the county. Uh, have a good evening, and again, thank you for your support and for your presence here tonight.